This week on Second Nature, overpopulation. So many men and women, so little time. What can be done? Look, you know the world's a mess. The sky has holes in it. It's raining acid. Water is toxic. Air stinks. What do we do about it? Politicians aren't addressing the problem. And the corporations won't jeopardize sales. And too many eco-freaks are staging stunts for the media. So let's talk to some people who were suggesting solutions before most folks knew there was a problem. Because when your planet's in trouble, you can't run away. I tried. Watch this and see how well that worked out. Anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe has voted English only signs. Mm. 40,000 tons of Armed with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Greetings, prisoners of gravity. This is Commander Rick. Recently, some of my friends faxed me up a copy of Our Angry Earth, and I couldn't put it down. First, because up in space, there is no down. And second, because it's an ecology book that offers a plan of action. Our Angry Earth was written by Frederick Pohl and the late Isaac Asimov, two science fiction authors who've been pondering our eco-future for 50 years. Isaac Asimov's 1954 novel, Caves of Steel, is set in a crowded, polluted urban jungle. And Frederick Pohl's 1992 effort, Mining the Earth, explores a future where humans have exhausted Earth's resources. Yesterday, I called Fred and asked why he co-wrote a non-fiction book on ecology. I wanted to write the book, and I persuaded Isaac to help me write the book. Not only to talk about the damage that's being done to the environment, because there are many other books written like that, but to talk about the only way that I perceived for dealing with the damage, which is partly technological, but more political, because a great deal of effort has to be put into reforming the political system so that reforming our environmental practices can happen. Basically, in the United States, and to a lesser degree almost everywhere, the people who make the nation's laws are under debt to the people who finance their campaigns and do other things for them. So they're not really legislating for the benefit of the country. They're legislating for the benefit of their supporters. And uh, that's a large part of the message in Our Angry Earth, what you can do about that and what you can't. Zero population growth has been a long-time concern of science fiction writers. You wrote about it in your short story, The Census Takers, back in 1955. So I was surprised you only gave it a brief mention in Our Angry Earth. It uh, isn't the urgent problem. I think that there is a point at which uh, population must, be, must stop growing unless we find some other planets or habitats in space or something to put people in because there's a point at which the human race can, I mean, if you allow growth to go on without expansion to go on without any sort of limitation, sooner or later the whole planet has to turn into writhing masses of human beings. But in environmental terms, if all the four billion or so people of the third world were to disappear right this second, we would still have the ozone depletion problem. We would still have the global warming problem. We would still have most of the problems of pollution of the air and water and so on, because those are done by a tiny minority of the human race. It isn't just the number of people who are causing the most critical problems now. It is the way we fortunate people who have the opportunity to ruin the Earth are doing it. There's not much that a uh, uh, an Indian peasant can do to damage the whole world. When they do the best they can, they chop down every piece of wood for miles around so that they 
deforest the slopes and the Ganges River runs in mud and all that, but they don't have the capacity for global damage that we have. So just limiting the population would not solve our problems. The immediate problem. In the long range, yes, it's important, but I was more concerned with today and the next year. Political reform as the first step to saving the environment is not a new idea. It's a central theme in Pacific Edge, Kim Stanley Robinson's near future novel, which we discussed a few weeks back. And it's also an emerging theme in the comic book, Concrete. Check out this sly and sophisticated series about Ron Lithgow, a fairly ordinary fellow who is trapped in an alien body made of cement. It's kind of crushed his social life, but it hasn't affected his career as a speechwriter for a U.S. Senator. Ron uses his position to push ecological issues to the top of Senator Douglas's agenda. Paul, what do you see as the biggest ecological problem facing us? It's funny, uh, when you asked that question, I, I went through images of deserts growing or rainforests being cut down. But the one with the most ramifications is overpopulation. Just the more people um, striving to get ahead, using whatever tools they have to uh, turn the non-economic values of this world into economic values, uh, it's, it's a juggernaut. Well, several of your stories have made the point that population control needs to be revived as an issue. But should politics play a role in that? And, and if so, how? This is one of those big questions that I'm not really... <laughs> I'm not really qualified to delve into. Uh, but we were actually making quite a bit of progress in the 70s on, on uh, family planning uh, globally. And that was all changed with what is now referred to as the Mexico City policy, which denied any funding to uh, family planning programs that offered abortion as an option. And although there's very much an ideological case to make that population control is more important in the affluent countries because we consume so much more and, and, and uh, consequently uh, have further reaching environmental effects, I think the place that we can really make progress is these poor women that are having pregnancy after pregnancy up to eight kids with no means of, uh, of really supporting them beyond a bare subsistence level. There's a, there's a burning desire for family planning in the third world that we're just, uh, we've just chosen not to fulfill. Stan, one of your characters in Pacific Edge says that after visiting India, she understood how it would be possible for people to overrun the earth. How important is population control to our species' survival? I think it's very important that we come to recognize that controlling population growth is critical to the health of the world in the 21st century. The thing is that it's only a part of a larger equation which also has to do with consumption. I mean, the reason we worry about overpopulation is that there's the 12 billion people on the Earth's surface will consume too many of the resources and uh, put out too many wastes for the Earth to be able to respond. But um, they have this term called the Indian equivalent baby amongst demographers, which is to say that any American baby born now will uh, use up as much natural resources as 50 Indian babies born at the same time. And so overconsumption in the advanced nations is as much of a problem as overpopulation in the poorer countries, where uh, population growth is much more rapid. So, in other words, we need to control both uh, population itself and also overconsumption in the advanced countries. 